On today's show, it's Red vs. Blue, Intel vs. AMD, Jeff vs. an Imperial Red. Today's video is brought to you by EVGA's Elite Member Program, a loyalty plan for the modern PC parts shopper. Members can expect to receive exclusive discounts on EVGA hardware, access to Elite Member-only giveaways, and best of all, 24 hours of exclusive access to newly launched EVGA hardware. And yes, that means you get a 24-hour head start on the general public when looking to buy a next-generation graphics card. Members can also take part in the EVGA Affiliate Program, allowing you to share discount codes with others and earn commissions on any sales made. Elite membership is free to join. Visit EVGA.com Elite to sign up and use affiliate code Craft Computing to get a discount on your next purchase. Get exclusive access to the gear you want. Save money, make money. That's EVGA.com slash Elite, or follow the link down in the video description. Welcome back to Craft Computing, everyone. As always, I'm Jeff. A couple weeks ago, I reviewed the Aerofara 2, a quad-core Celeron-based system, which could be set up as a pretty amazing RetroPie alternative. But what if you wanted something with a little bit more power, but still wanted it to be a set-top-sized box? Today, I'm going to take a look at a pair of pint-sized PCs that might just fit that bill. On my left here is the Aerofara Aero 3, an Intel i5 10210U based system on the Comet Lake architecture with Intel's 10th generation UHD graphics. It has 8GB of 2400 MHz DDR4 and 256 gigabytes of SSD storage. Connectivity wise, you're looking at a pair of HDMI 2.0 ports, Gigabit LAN, four USB 3 ports and one USB Type-C, Wi-Fi 6 and Bluetooth 5.0 on board, and a built-in micro SD slot. All in all, this will run you $479 on Amazon and includes a Windows 10 home license. And on my right is the Gigabyte Bricks Pro, an AMD powered system based off the Ryzen V1605B embedded APU. It has a 2 GHz base clock and a 3.6 GHz boost, as well as Vega 8 graphics on board. Now this system is available as a bare bones kit, so you will need to install your own memory and storage. I went ahead and threw in eight gigabytes of 3200 megahertz Samsung DDR4, but it seems to peak at just 2400 megahertz. I've also got a 250 gigabyte 860 Evo drive to handle all of our storage needs. Now as the system is not necessarily meant to be a set-top box, its port layout is a little bit unique. Starting off, we've got four HDMI 2.0 ports, which all support 4K60, dual gigabit Ethernet, four USB 2.0s, two USB 3.2s, 802.11ac, and Bluetooth 4.2. The bare bones kit will run you $279, another $40 for 8GB of DDR4, and $45 for a 250GB storage drive, bringing your total to $364 direct off Amazon. Full disclosure, before we move forward, Aerofara did send me out the Aero 3 for review. However, like all reviews on my channel, no money changed hands, and Aerofara has zero say over the content of this video and does not see it before it goes live on YouTube. As far as the Gigabyte Bricks, I purchased this system with my own money for a separate project. However, I figured it would be a great point of comparison given these similar specs. Taking a look at both systems, the Aero 3 is about half the size of the Gigabyte Bricks and has a notably sleeker design. The rounded corners and silver chassis make it look much more at home beside a modern TV compared to the much more dated design from the Gigabyte. But that's mostly on purpose, as these two machines have very different market segments they're trying to capture. The Aero 3 is being marketed pretty much the way I'm reviewing it today, as a small form factor PC for general purpose computing. The Bricks, on the other hand, is an industrial PC first, mainly targeting video walls, digital signage, or business small form factor installations. There is a major difference in the CPUs being used here as well. Whereas the Intel chip is your standard off-the-shelf i5 mobile CPU, the Ryzen V1605B is designed for embedded systems and has never seen a consumer launch. It's a CPU that I've been wanting to benchmark for quite some time, given its four cores of Zen 1 architecture and Vega 8 graphics, all in a 25 watt package. Both PCs include VESA mounts to strap them to the back of a monitor, allowing you to essentially build your own all-in-one desktop PC. Eat your heart out, Apple. But today I'm going to look at low-end gaming, specifically a few of my favorite free-to-play games along with a couple emulation tests. This isn't going to be the most scientific review comparing frame times or 0.1% lows, because neither of these PCs was designed to be a high-end gaming machine. Instead, I'm only going to look at overall playability of games between the two systems. 
But first, let's find out how these CPUs perform head to head. While these small form factor boxes were never intended to do any rendering work, Cinebench is still a great generalized benchmark for CPU comparisons, no matter what Intel tries to claim. In R15, we see the Ryzen 1605 take a narrow lead over Blue's Comet Lake, 639 to 613. While the multi-threaded score is pitiful compared to modern CPUs, that puts it firmly up against chips like the i7-2600 and the Xeon E5-1620 V2, which are some of the fastest non-overclocked CPUs from the Sandy Bridge and Ivy Bridge eras. But keep in mind, both of these chips are only drawing 25 watts, and I'm comparing them against 95 watt desktop parts. In single-threaded performance, it was a clear win for Intel, with a score of 163 to 135. While Intel is competing with the likes of Zen Plus CPUs, like the Ryzen 5 2400G or the Intel i5 8400, the 1605 is relegated to playing in the sandbox with the previously referenced Ivy Bridge chips. There is a wrinkle to the story here, though, as the Intel 10 to 10 u thermal throttled after just 30 seconds of testing dropping its core clock from 4.1 GHz to 3.8. Not that a lot of performance would be left on the table here, but it is something that's worth noting. The Ryzen CPU, on the other hand, had no problem maintaining its 3.6 GHz boost clock, and did it with a much quieter fan. But will the single-threaded performance disparity keep Intel ahead in gaming? Remember, Comet Lake is still using Intel's UHD solution for graphics, not their newly released Intel XE platform from Rocket Lake. Meanwhile, AMD's Vega 8, while not the fastest GPU in the world, does compete with the likes of the NVIDIA GT1030. Spoiler alert, no. Starting with Rocket League at 1080p and low settings, the Vega 8 is the clear winner, managing to keep well above 45 FPS more often than not. In fact, I had enough performance headroom left to enable FXAA to clean up the image quality substantially. Meanwhile, Intel's UHD graphics were giving Nintendo Switch owners some bragging rights. The game is a stuttery mess, topping out at about 25 FPS or so, and looking terrible in the process. Anecdotally, while I'm not the best Rocket League player ever, I found myself misjudging hits more often than not on the Intel system rather than the AMD. Not that my skills are much of a benchmark. Moving on to CSGO, again at 1080p, but with medium settings. Here again, the Intel UHD struggles to maintain a consistent frame rate, but the game is far more playable than Rocket League could ever dream of being. It still had plenty of occasional stutters and frame rate drops, but overall, I would call this one a much better experience. The Vega 8 was again the clear winner here, and it wasn't even a fair fight. While Intel struggled to keep the game around 40 FPS, Team Red held 60 FPS with relative ease. There were also no noticeable frame drops or stutters during gameplay, even with the decided single-threaded CPU disadvantage. Warframe is a free-to-play single and multiplayer game, and I like to pick it up every once in a while. It's a great looking title with some great fast action gameplay. While console owners were fairly happy with frame rates between 25 and 30 for much of the last 15 years, PC gamers have slightly higher standards. The game is certainly playable on Intel's UHD graphics, hovering right around 30 FPS most of the time. But here again, the V1605B industrial CPU flexes its muscles, typically sitting around 60 FPS with low frame rates bottoming out around 35. While frame rates aren't what make a game good, it's definitely nice to be able to play at 60 instead of 30, especially in faster paced titles. And finally, since I see these possibly being used as set-top boxes, I figured I'd give the Dolphin emulator a quick run. Like in my test with the Aerofara 2, I fired up Wind Waker, but this time with 2x native resolution scaling and with widescreen support. Neither PC had any problems at all, running at a near perfect 30 FPS the entire time. And it's the same story moving into Wii titles. While the Aero 2 was not able to run anything from that side of the library, the Aero 3 and Gigabyte Bricks again make short work of it at 2x resolution. So if a retro emulation box is on your list, both systems would be right at home next to your TV. And yes, it pains me just a little bit to admit that the GameCube is a retro system. As far as esports and free-to-play titles, while the Aero 3 puts up a good fight, it just can't compete with a system with dedicated graphics on board, even if it's still just a first-generation Ryzen APU. But don't get me wrong, I think both systems still have their place. While the Aero 3 may have lost in gaming performance, it is still half the size of the Gigabyte Bricks in a much more attractive package. Plus, with Intel QuickSync on board, it would make a dynamite Plex server. On the other hand, the Gigabyte Bricks would make a fantastic digital signage server, which is kind of what it's meant to do. Or it would be a Dark Horse candidate for a home PFSense box. But 
What do you guys think? Which system would you buy and what would you use them for? Let me know down in the comments below. On your way down there, make sure to drop this video a like and subscribe to Craft Computing if you haven't done so already. And if you're interested in either of these systems, I will have Amazon affiliate links down in the video description. Go give those a look. If you like the content you see on this channel and want to help me keep the lights on around here, you can also find a link down in the video description to my Patreon or Floatplane. Thank you all so much for watching this one, and as always, I will see you in the next video. Cheers, guys. Beer for today is from Ex Novo Brewing. It is the JB Shot First, and I've got to say I love the can name and the can art. Um, I'm not sure who JB is, but shout out to JB for having the guts to shoot first. This is an Imperial Red brewed with Amarillo and Centennial hops, 80 IBUs, and 8%. I love a good red ale, and this one's already making my nose tingle. If you're wondering how stable the head is, uh, about that much. Ah, not even doing the review yet, but ah, so malty. Once the head has settled down on this, it is just this velvety smooth cream on top that really is not going anywhere. Oh, that is so malty and so rich without being like pastry stout levels of sweet. It's definitely a very, very sweet concoction, but there's just enough bitterness from the, the hops, specifically the Amarillo hops. Those are, those are what are really sticking onto my tongue. Uh, Man, there's just enough balance here to make this just delicious. It's kind of like a Guinness made love to an IPA. I can't get over how good this red is. Like, like I am really a fan of, of red ales, especially when they're very, very malty and very hop forward like this one is. Um, it's just good. It, it's hard to find a good red ale. Notably, you can get like the Ninkasi Dawn of the Red, I think this out does that, and that's pretty high praise.